If I could choose to have any power in the world, I would choose time travel. Researching the past is the closest you can come to that. This is Open Field School, a small school on Thetford Hill in Vermont. This is the Latham and Kendrick store. Hard to believe, but this is the same place. The 1820 census of Vermont, the average height of all trees was about 250 feet. You will be very hard pressed to find a tree that tall today. Most of the trees out here run between 40 and 60 feet tall. And the average diameter of trees pretty much across all species was four and a half to five feet in diameter. The lifespan of a maple tree is about 500 years if left undisturbed. And interestingly, those trees, those woods were not like the woods today. Those trees are further apart than the trees are today. So there would be a tree every 20 feet instead of like we have today, much, much, much closer together. Thetford was open to European settlers in 1761. Many of these settlers relocated from places such as Hebron and Lebanon. In Connecticut, they would have traveled on the Connecticut River by canoe. They would have cleared land near the Connecticut River to farm and construct log cabins to live in. There was also a settlement on the Ompom Penusik River. The waterfalls there made it a good site for mills such as Grins Mill and Sawmill. These early European settlers had a log meeting house near present day East Thetford, but by the 1780s it was too small. After much debate, it was decided that the new meeting house should be built on Thetford Hill because it was the center of travel. At that time, there was only one settler on Thetford Hill, a man named Beriah Loomis. After the meeting house was complete, more people started moving to the hill. Sometime around 1815, William Harris Latham moved from Lyme, New Hampshire to Thetford Hill, Vermont. His father, Arthur Latham, ran a very successful general store in Lyme at the site of the current Lyme hardware store. William was going to open a branch of the Latham general store on Thetford Hill with the help of his brother-in-law, Dr. Thomas Kendrick. There were not any bridges built across the Connecticut River in this area, so Latham would have to cross the Connecticut River by ferry boat. Roads between large towns were often toll roads. Travelers had to stop to pay the toll. These were called turnpikes because a long stick or pike was turned out of the way after each person paid the toll. The roads between smaller towns were usually muddy, bumpy, and hard going. It was not a very comfortable way to travel. Latham had to travel downhill to the banks of the Connecticut River. Then he and his horse boarded a small flat boat using the ferry passengers across the river. The North Thetford Bridge was built in 1822. The East Thetford Bridge was not built until 1839. Once he was across the Connecticut River, Harris Latham had about two more miles of uphill travel to get to Thetford Hill. Although it was only four miles 
from Lyme to Thetford Hill, it may have taken Latham all afternoon to get there. He and Thomas Kendrick built a large house split down the middle for their two families. Their house has been called the Double House and it is still standing in its original location. Mr. Latham and his brother-in-law, Mr. Kendrick, had to clear the trees in order to have space to build a general store. They would have cut down the trees using axes and crosscut saws. A crosscut saw needs one person on each end to operate the saw. After the trees were cleared, they would have used levers to clear the rocks and hand shovels to dig the foundation. The round rocks that they dug up were used to make stone walls. Flatter rocks were used in the process of building the foundation. Latham and Kendrick may have found Abenaki tools including Native American scrapers, adds, and rubbing balls while digging the foundation. So we have to think about the progress of technology. Before water mills were built, there had to be some way to cut boards. So they used a pit saw, digging a hole in the ground, and then one man would stand in the hole and work with one end of the saw. The other man would stand on the ground and work with the other end of the saw, and they would cut boards off the, saw, off the logs. The beams would make the frame of the building, and then they needed wood board, wooden boards to side the building. There we go. The first floor was used for a general store. In the second floor, they rented out to Wilson Farnsworth for a law office. Soon the general store was part of the thriving village. To help you understand what life was like in the 1830s, I will introduce you to the fictional Thomas family. Let's imagine that Mr. Thomas is going to the general store for some supplies. To trade, he brings some candles his daughters have made, a pound of butter his wife has made, and a hundred pounds of potash he made from the ashes in his fireplace. The general store is a place where people gather to talk, play games, and shop. Neither Ellis Howe nor Isaac Singer has invented the sewing machine yet, so the people Mr. Thomas sees are wearing hand-stitched clothing. Because it takes so long to make clothing, these people only have two or three outfits. Mr. Thomas gives his trade goods to Mr. Kendrick. The value of these items is almost $4. In exchange, Mr. Thomas buys boots for his daughter, a wash tub, three papers of garden seeds, a dinner pot to hang in their fireplace, a bushel of corn, and a pound of coffee. As a special treat, he buys some almond candy for his children. These items will cost $3.48. Mr. Kendrick keeps track of this transaction in his daybook. He will later recopy this information into his ledger so he knows that the Thomas family has 31 cents of credit at his store. His previous business partner, Harris Latham, has opened a new general store in North Thefford and he has a similar account book. Meanwhile, Mrs. Thomas and her two daughters are at home. Mrs. Thomas is cooking, cleaning, and taking care of the animals, and her daughters, Elizabeth and Jane, are helping her and doing chores of their own. The general store also serves as Thefford Hills post office, so Mr. Thomas checks for mail while he's there. 
Appointed in 1828, Mr. Kendrick is Thefford Hill's third postmaster. The mail arrives once a week on the stagecoach along with passengers. The goods at the store have probably traveled up the Connecticut River on flatboats and then to a hill on wagons. In another decade, the goods and mail will both be delivered by railroad to a train station in East Thefford. In December of 1843, the village heard cries of fire. When Wilson Farnsworth responded, he discovered that his second-floor law office and Latham and Kendrick's store downstairs were burning. He rushed upstairs to rescue his stuff, but only found ashes. We think he may have jumped out a window and into a pile of snow. Uh, open Field School, started by Ms. Jean All. The um, Thetford Hill Post Office was also in the building. And people used to come in the front door, and then they would turn right, and there was a post office window, and there was uh, a postmistress who would um, give out the mail. All the little mailboxes were in the back. And, also, and so it was... Uh, a building that was used for many different purposes. And it was very interesting to be a school in the middle of all that. What's the story behind the name Vermontica? Vermontica essentially talks of things coming from or of Vermont. It uh, uh, reminds me of uh, more rural and taking the tradition of New England and putting it together into something a little more modern. So in and of and from Vermont, you get Vermontica. I 
I get my inspiration from largely from objects that I find. So objects that you would recognize. There's an old rake. Uh, it's a flattened shovel. There's a base to an old bicycle seat. Auger bits. I would say my favorite piece of furniture is a small uh, pedestal table that's in my living room. I like seeing an idea made manifest. I like, uh, uh, you know, I, I like to see something work. Taking an abstract idea and, and forming it into something concrete. I started making furniture uh, out of college, uh, out of necessity. Um, I didn't have much money and I needed to furnish an apartment so I made furniture from pallets, which I'm sure I'm not the first one and I'm sure I'm not the last. Uh, but really uh, what got me started on the track that I'm on currently was a job that I got in Seattle with uh, David Galassa's company uh, at 6 Braven Street. Um, I walked in, I didn't know what to expect, and I was immediately impacted by the environment and everything that was happening around me. We got an idea for a pendant light. The pendant light won't look like this, but there's something to this that uh, I enjoy. Well, my most famous client would be Uma Thurman. I do not know her. A designer bought a table that I made and it ended up in Uma Thurman's apartment in New York City. My dream would be to have a destination type place, a place where the public could come in, uh, see a gallery space uh, that would have my work in it, but also the work of other artists and artisans. A destination. People would come from afar to go to Vermontica and experience Vermontica.
Once upon a time, two little girls grew up, one in Norwich, Vermont, and the other in Hanover, New Hampshire, destined to become the best of friends. While growing up, the two girls had everything their hearts could ever desire. Large grounds for play, towering leafy trees to climb, ponds to swim in, ice to skate on. Even a circus camp every summer that they both loved. Heartbreak was blocked, sadness unknown, and fear was unheard of as the two girls innocently matured and grew older. Until one fateful day, at the age of 16, they boarded a plane and ventured away from their life in Vermont to land in a place far, far, far away. I went to Zambia as part of a youth circuit exchange. I went because I was like, hey, it would be fun to do circus in Zambia and like experience Zambia. But the trip was so much more than that. While in Zambia, me and 16 American kids performed with 30 kids from Tripolia who trained with Circus Zambia. So during the exchange, we trained together, and then, like, the funny part is that not everyone is able to speak English. So it's funny how they communicate using circus. Circus Zambia is this amazing organization. It's a social circus, and it uses circus as a tool to help at-risk kids. The kids that we train circus with are from Jabolia, and they're so talented, so smart, so dedicated. They work so hard. I just love them.
I came part of Sika Zambia when I was seven years old. So, Chiwolia is known as a notorious bird compound, which I come from. About 40,000 people live in Jibulia. I mean, we didn't really see the real Jibulia when we went. We saw happy kids running and seeing Americans, like some for the first time, seeing white people. They are happy because of you who went there, because to them, it makes them happy because, oh, now we have finally have important people coming to Chiwolia. But then you also see some kids that aren't so happy. You see little girls walking around with scars from knife fights. And then you ask one of the Circus Zambia kids, and they're like, hey, will that little girl survive? And they're like, probably not. And then you just keep walking. It's like people are afraid to go there because they heard stories that you worry if you go there, you won't come back alive. Most of them were wearing dirty, tattered clothing. Lots of girls there get married and pregnant by the time they're 14. I feel unlucky sometimes. Like A lot of times, like I feel unlucky. Like, why me? What did I do wrong? Like, yeah. If you come from Chiwolia, no one believes in you and no one will trust you. So sad. Like life in Chiwolia is totally hard. Walking through Chiwolia is emotionally challenging. You look around and you see these buildings that are so small, that are falling apart, and you're like, people live here. Those are their houses. That's where they spend all their time. And then you think about your own three-story huge house, and you just feel so bad. Walking back into my house was like, like what do we need with all this stuff? Like, Can we just give everything we have to the kids? Growing up in Vermont, in the Upper Valley. It's like this perfect little bubble. Probably one of the most perfect places I can think of to grow up in. My biggest worry in life is like losing my 4.0. But a Chipotle kid's biggest worry in life is not having food to eat. At my high school, I'm like dying from all my Russian lit homework while the kids in Nibolia are literally dying. It is not fair at all that I have so much and they have so little. How am I supposed to be okay with that? Like there's so many people who need so much help. Chibulia is just one compound in Lusaka, which is one city in one country in the world. I feel like I can't just sit around being like, oh, I feel so bad about all this stuff I have, but I have to just use all the stuff I have and all the power that I have to somehow grow up and make changes to help people who have less. You just know that you have to do something because how could you look at yourself in the mirror if you didn't? The exchange was amazing, fantastic, and then at the end, people cried like, uh, you don't want them to go. The exchange was probably one of the best two weeks of my life. It was absolutely incredible, and every day I wish I could go back. I sick us famosi, so it's like when we are together, nothing can harm us. We we'll always stay strong and we we'll always love each other. And that's how our fairy tale ends. With the two girls having learned that the world is both a little bigger and a little smaller than they thought when they were growing up in the magical kingdom of Vermont.
probably agree because of what you said to me. And did I mention I hate the way you look so sly? I never doubted that if I asked for help, you'd turn a blind eye. I'm not nothing, and I swear I'll prove you wrong. You're the reason why. I'm 18 years old. I live in Burlington, Vermont. I use she, her, they, them, or he, him pronouns, and you're fine. And I identify non-binary, uh, transmasculine, or genderqueer. All right, so I was born in Burlington, uh, moved to Essex Junction, um, lived in Essex uh, Junction for five years, and I moved to Moortown, Vermont, which is like a small rural, rural town. I guess after Hurricane Irene, my town was flooded, my home was flooded, and so um, because of a financial deficit that my family faced because of the flood, we moved up here to Burlington, where we've been for five years. Um, I've been singing since I was, like, practically out of the womb. <laughs> um, my dad is a guitarist and a musician, so every time, you know, I heard him play as a little kid, I was always just very inspired by him and just wanted to... Uh, I wanted to be like him when I grew up, and I wanted to learn what he could do. And creating music, the passion for making music the way that I do, um, has always been a part of me. <laughs> I started to post uh, YouTube videos when I was 12, and I posted uh, once a week. Just put up like an instrumental on my computer and started playing it and sang along to it. Uh, it was like this terrible webcam video. When I was in fifth grade, I started teaching myself guitar, so I was dabbling with guitar a little bit, but I wasn't like super great at it yet. Around the same time as when I started to um, be out as gay, that um, or you know, as liking women that. Uh, my YouTube channel really started to pick up um, because people really liked that I was playing guitar, people really liked that I was out and that I was being open about it. As a young um, kid uh, going on YouTube and watching videos of people singing and videos of um, gay people talking about being gay or trans people talking about being trans and I just remember feeling so empowered. I hope that with my YouTube channel in the future I'll be able to uh, and with my music in general, I'll be able to to just like show other kids that you know whatever whatever they feel deep deep inside is uh, is okay on the outside too, and should be accepted on the outside and will be accepted on the outside and will be embraced and will be loved on the outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm my weird girl. I don't know. I think I'm a, I think I'm a boy sometimes. I'm a girl sometimes. Oh yeah. She's kind of cool. Well, that's good. That's good. Say won't let go. Just say won't let go. I'll wake you up with some breakfast in bed. I'll bring you. How does that sound good? Yeah. <laughs> I said you're cute. And I said that I wish your girlfriend don't be the cute. <laughs> oh, can I have a hug? Let's start with a hug. How's that sound? Good? He's a boy, I know it. Because he said that he has a girlfriend, so... Have you ever met a girl who dates a girl? No. Wait, wait, no. No? No. Well, some, sometimes girls go out with girls, and that's okay, too. Sometimes, Do they kiss? Sometimes. And sometimes boys kiss boys. And, yeah, I know, I'm it's like shocked. totally mind-blowing and shocking and crazy, but... You do that? It's just the same kind of love. I don't know, I don't kiss boys. Boys aren't, I don't really... I never really had a crush on boys. I don't know why. It just didn't happen. And you like boys, right? Um, I like you. And you like me. 
Would you like me even if I was a girl? Yes. Would you like me even if I was just a person? Yes. Yeah? You don't mind about my gender? Where do you live? <laughs> Uh, I identify non-binary transmasculine, which is essentially that I feel as if I identify um, sort of outside of the male-female binary, um, which, you know, can be a bit of a hard thing for people to get their heads wrapped around at times, but the transmasculine part of that is just that uh, I have chosen to and feel most comfortable in a body that presents in a more masculine way. Sort of the way that I feel about pronouns is that if um, I meet someone and somebody looks at me and they're like, wow, you really strike me as, as a guy for some reason. Then, you know, if they feel most comfortable using he, him, then that's what they should use with me. If they feel most comfortable using she, her, that's what they should use. People have this tendency to sort of take something that really is a spectrum and put it into groups. But the way that it works, you know, in many people's brains, like people like me, is that it's just sort of like, you know, somewhere over here is kind of, you know, conventionally masculine, somewhere over here is whatever conventionally feminine means, and then there's just all this in-between gray space that you can just kind of come up with and make up along the way and enjoy and indulge in and be and whatever, and so some people feel as if just because they have a penis doesn't mean they are a man. A man can mean anything to someone, and it can mean anything to someone else. Um, I am me, I am Sadie, I am identifying somewhere in between male and female and I and I have always identified somewhere in between male and female and I'm gonna talk about gender in the way that I best understand it and have always best understood it. It doesn't have anything to do with um, the way that other people tell me gender should be for me. Yeah, I would just say, you know, keep an open mind <laughs> is all. <laughs> Pictures often lend themselves to be like a helpful um, reminder almost to me as like the different stages that I went through in discovering myself. This this is me in my junior year um, and, and then this is me uh, as a six month year old. So just to give you an idea of how long, what the difference is in these photos to second grade and um, obviously I'm, I'm wearing my brother's my little brother's t-shirt in this photo um, and this was like my favorite shirt ever and I just I look I feel like when I look into this picture I feel like I look happy I feel comfortable I, I actually really liked that shirt because in third grade I wore the same same exact one um, this is a uh, fourth grade it's just another thing I just I, I, I just remember forever and ever I always felt so much more comfortable in um, shopping in the boys section. And it wasn't even, to me, it wasn't even the boys section. It was like, it was the me section. It was like, here's the clothes that I wanna wear and I'm gonna walk towards them and purchase them if I like them now. I didn't understand why Liam, my brother, could just walk around the house with no shirt on and I couldn't. And I was like, you know, at this point my parents are saying, Sadie, um, you wanna go out and get some training bras? Or what are you thinking? Like, you're starting to get to that age, and I'm like, oh my god, I don't even wanna think about that. I don't wanna wear bras. I don't, want, I don't even wanna wear, like, clothes <laughs> half the time. Uh, this is uh, eighth grade. I started to wear some more feminine clothes, uh, grew my hair out longer, and I started to try to fit into this 
It's like I tried to fit into this image of what I thought a teenage girl should be. That just doesn't even look like me. Like, I see it and I'm just like, it doesn't, it doesn't look like anything I've ever been. It doesn't look like, I, I know that, you know, at this point, freshman year, um, I was really depressed. I was having a really hard time. I was going in the right direction. I knew that I was taking a step in the right direction. I cut my hair short. At um, that point, I got a girlfriend also and started. I started going out with my first girl. I came out to my family as gay. And I just, I feel like you see in this picture, I just started to look a lot happier. And I even think I can see the comfort between these two photos completely shift. Like my confidence, my happiness, my existence. I'm like, okay, this is great. And my shirt got shorter. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it with this chest sh Yeah, it's kind of amazing, actually. I don't know. I was a happy kid. I was a very happy kid. <laughs> I'm still a happy kid. <laughs> I'm a particularly happy kid now. <laughs> yeah. That's so is this feeling that a part of your body or um, a part of your being really is something that doesn't quite fit um, right or sometimes even feels alien um, in, in a in mixture with you, with who you are. You know, I hit puberty. Uh, I have this distinct memory of when I was like 10 or 11. Um, I took my shirt off and I stood in front of the mirror and I looked at myself. And then I took my hands and I covered myself and I looked again at myself and I pulled them apart and I looked at myself and I was, I just thought, that's better. And it wasn't, it wasn't this internal, like, oh, I hate my, like, I'm so fat. Like I, it was, it wasn't like this self image thing, which a lot of people misunderstand dysphoria to be like, pe I feel like a lot of people think that dysphoria, you know, that you could, um, you know, like have weight problems and then be like, oh, I'm dysphoric about my belly. It's not, you know, it's not like this is seriously like something that is not meant to be on my body and it's never been meant to be on my body. I would go out in public and I would wear very, very, very baggy shirts so I could hide my chest because I didn't want people to know that I was a girl. I was thinking, you know, I didn't want people to know that. I didn't know why I didn't want people to know that, but I just knew that it didn't feel right and it felt horrible to me, like in a way that I can't even describe. The moment I found out what top surgery was, you know, my breasts became sandbags, and I was like, okay, <laughs> I understand that these are here, but these are not my breasts, these are weights on my chest, and these will come off <laughs> eventually, and I will be free. And so I had my top surgery, um, the sandbags disappeared, and it was like, no question, without a second thought, without a moment of regret, this is what I've needed for my whole life, and it's finally here. Um, you know, and that was a that was a really beautiful experience in the hospital too, right after coming out of surgery, and I saw my chest and I just started crying like it's I don't even have words like to, to describe that, but that was a that was just that was an incredibly beautiful experience for me, so Welcome one and all my YouTube friends and family to my top surgery eve. <laughs> The time right now is uh, 11.35, so I'm about to go in. Yay. See you later. I love you. It is 7.20. I got out 2.30, so we're like five hours post-op now. I got my first uh, confused nurse um, using he, him, and then she, her, and then just all kinds of different pronouns. Like, I don't I have no idea what this person is, so... What is that thing? It's a new game. Everybody who meets me can play it. What is that thing? I just got dressed. I'm all binded up. One thing I want to say is that you cannot be 
too prepared for how hard this is. This is not an easy procedure. This in no way like it might look easy or seem easy, but it's not. I feel happier than I think I ever have been. It's awesome. Regardless of whether you are trans or non-binary, regardless of whether you even know what that is or care what it is, as a loved one of someone, if you know someone who is that way, the most important moment of that person's life forever will be the moment when they look in the mirror and they see themselves looking back at them. The best second of my whole life was when I looked in that mirror and I saw myself looking back. And I'm lucky that my parents were the type of people that had never even heard of the concept of non-binary when they, you know, heard me say it. But they just took the time to learn because they love me. And they didn't say that's not real. They didn't put it down. They didn't say you're sick. They didn't say, you know, silence it. They didn't say hide it. They said, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, and we'll help you. Nothing matters, Mary, when you're free Against the famine and the crowd I rebelled, they tore me down You must raise our child with dignity I've, I've uh, known this song and um, heard people singing this song and sung it myself since I was a, since I was a kid myself. And uh, so it's very meaningful to me to sing it with you. Um, having you changes that song entirely for me. Um, I know that the, that the, you know, the whole, the, the Irish heritage is all about so, you know, so many things, good and bad. Um, but men and women, men and women and, you know, uh, very traditional. But you're as much the guy in the song as you are the woman in this, in this song. And that's really beautiful to me. I can't tell you at the moment. I can't tell you when I knew. I can't tell you uh, when I knew. When I knew what in the you know in, in, the, uh, in the delivery room, holding you and rocking you and sort of calming you and and it was just really, really great. And that year had nothing to do with are you a boy? Are you a? It had nothing to do with that. It was just what a beautiful, amazing being you are. What an amazing soul you are. It, 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 it's when you sit down at the table and you tell me. That you are, um, that you need to tell us that you're non-binary, and you have tears in your eyes and you're worried. I realize how much of the bias is unspoken, and how much we carry with us. We parents carry with us without knowing it. Some parents would see their kid and assume, oh, you know, I can't wait for my like mom saved her wedding dress for me. It's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. um, and I cried when I came out because I was I was thinking like. Man, like, man, like, I, I don't, I don't want to not, I don't want to not wear mom's wedding dress because mom saved it for me for years. But then she, in that moment, looked in my eyes and and said to me, like, you don't have to wear my wedding dress. You could wear dad's tux. <laughs> and you looked at me and said, why? You know, I still, I still have my suit. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. Let's and that, that was all I needed right there. That was like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I also heard a lot about kids being rejected from their families and about kids you know like these horror stories of like teenagers whose families just say I'm kicking you out I'm not giving you any support you know no, you know parents don't eat some parents don't even believe that that LGBTQ plus youth exist that they're real that that what they're feeling is valid that who they are is genuine and I cried because I was relieved of this heavy feeling and this worry and this stress that what might happen to me is what's happened to Mm -hmm. thousands of queer kids in the country, hundreds of thousands of people in the world who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Mm -hmm. I just said it out loud and, and they're not rejecting me. They're right there with me. They're sitting there. My dad's crying and I am too and it's beautiful. It was amazing. <laughs> I'm going to start crying again. But... <laughs> it was brought up uh, Catholic. Do I feel as comfortable with, with men being intimate? And, and in, in the spirit of being, of being honest and truthful, and, and I, I don't know why it is, but that is harder for me. But that's, a limit, that's my limitation. That's something that's going on 
for me. Uh, but whether you're Catholic or whether you're Protestant or whether you're, you know, whatever you are, it's about love. It's about love. It's about love. I was transphobic as a little kid. Hmm. Why? I don't know. Maybe because people told me that guys that dress up as girls are mentally ill. It's, it wasn't my fault that I felt that way. And it wasn't until I realized that, like, oh my god, like, I am one of those weird things that I even, like, discovered, like, I had to take a step back and think about it and go somewhere, like you said, that makes me uncomfortable, sort of, to come to terms with even myself and to come to terms with anyone else. It seems like... I don't want to speak for you, but it seems like to me one of the most pivotal moments in my relationship with you was when I was, from a very young age, I realized that I had the freedom to develop my passions, my interests, and even further beyond interests and separate from interests, my identity, my, my core identity. Um, you let me develop that without imposing what you wanted me to be on me you guys supported mm -hmm. me from the get-go and you, you I felt like you know rather than a weight on my head you were helium beneath my feet you were pushing beneath my wings you know you were pushing me up mm -hmm. up up a lot of us parents um, spend way too much time saying oh, no why don't you we'll do that later no no because we're afraid we're afraid we're afraid no 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 to fight the fight the first fight our first impulse to say no worry about protection and everything and say yes and then just get off your ass and go over and stand with your kid and watch your kid climb climb the rocks and be there <laughs> yeah man to be discouraged mm -hmm. is to not have courage so to have courage is to have is to is to ha have your heart be robust mm. and to be discouraged it just means that that someone's telling you or many people are telling you to just not listen to your heart. My life's been so uh, beautiful. I love being a dad to you. You want to be a hero, uh, really look your child in the eyes and, and uh, let them take you somewhere. Let them take you somewhere that you're scared to go. <laughs> Johnson City, Tennessee, and I got to get a move on a different side. I hear my baby calling my name, and I know that she's the only one. If I die in Friday, at least I will die free. So rock me, mama, like a wagon wheel. Rock me, mama, anyway. Just so my, you know, my, my advice for um, trans youth who are, you know, wondering what do I do and how do I handle this? For me, my answer always was to just be myself unapologetically. Just be you and be you without saying sorry to the world for being something that they weren't expecting. Obviously, it's really important to make sure that you are um, first, like, safe. You know, if I come out, you know, I won't be in danger. No one's going to hurt me. And it's it sucks that trans kids even have to think about that you know they shouldn't have to and and then my advice from there is just embrace the happiness that comes with being out <laughs> embrace the love embrace the feeling you know every time someone uses the right pronouns for you just like just celebrate it don't don't ever kill that person that's that's inside of you that's living in there don't silence it and don't shut it down just let it be and let it shine because it will it will come through and it'll be bright as hell <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I have to say about that. As long as you remember everything that I did, I can do this on my own. I'm sometimes lonely, but I am not alone. There are kids here just like My correct pronouns are they, them, theirs. My name is Eli, I'm 16, and I want to just tell you that you are a flower, just ready to bloom. You don't pick yourself, because you are beautiful too. My name is Alex, I use any pronouns.
Vermont PBS, partnering with local filmmakers to bring you stories made here. For more, visit vermontpbs.org.